Greetings, Pastor Henry here. I'm so glad that you've tuned in to this sermon and uh, this sermon series. What's love got to do with it? Well, this is February, the time when people are thinking about love, Valentine's Day, and it's quite the time to get excited about love. People are getting gifts and, and, and they're being shown love. What does the Bible have to say about this? Well, I believe the Bible has a lot to say. And if you've tuned into this sermon, you're going to get a biblical perspective of what love is all about. What's love got to do with it? Well, I would say love's got everything to do with it. So follow along in this series and you're not going to be disappointed. And God may just change what you think love is and how you actually show love. So I'm looking forward to sharing uh, um, uh, more messages with you. And I pray that this one in particular that you're listening to right now will be a blessing. God bless you. According to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, Then the Lord blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the Sabbath is blessed. God didn't bless the first day. God didn't bless the second day or the third to the sixth. God blessed the seventh day. What do I want you to understand? I want you to know that God wants to bless you today. Amen? Amen. And so look at your neighbor, smile at them and say, God bless you today. Bless you today. Amen. I like that, man. This is great. This is really, really, really beautiful. What's love got to do with it? We started this series last Sabbath. And we came to the conclusion that love got to do with restoration. Love is got to do with restoration. God told Hosea, go and marry a woman his wife who had cheated on him and he was to bring her back and they were to be restored in a marital relationship. And so we understood that God's love should inspire in us godly living and godly love for the unlovable. Today's sermon is entitled the signature of salvation. I'd like you to join me in standing as I have asked you last week as we read the word of God together. Please may you stand with me as we read the word of God together today. I have taken pains to translate the word of God and we are focusing on 1 John chapter 3 and verses 11 to 15. I have translated it for myself, but you can follow along in your own translations, but I want us to read it together this morning. The Bible says, according to my translation, because this is the instruction you understood the first time you heard the gospel, that you should love one another. Not like Cain, who belonged to the wicked one. He butchered his brother. And why did he butcher him? Because his actions were evil. But the actions of his brother were righteous. So don't be surprised, fellow believers of Christ, that the world hates you. We know that we have changed from condemnation to eternal life because we love fellow believers of Christ. Whoever does not love lives in a condemnation. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has no eternal life remaining in him. Let us pray. Father, your word has been read now I will attempt to proclaim. You know I am but a man and I'm not fit or suited for this task. Send your spirit, O oh God, 
that your people may hear your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Some things are just better or they go together in pairs, a thread or a needle, butter or bread, pepper and salt, socks and shoes. If we are in Jakarta, we would say a spoon and a fork. Uh, we would say gado gado and a peanut sauce. I also found pears in the Bible. Adam and Eve, not Adam or and Steve, Adam and Eve. Sodom and Gomorrah, Christ and the cross. And we can talk about more pairs. We, we can talk about five lo loaves and two fishes. We can say Daniel and Revelation. We can say the seventh day and the Sabbath. Uh, some things are just better in pairs. While studying the Bible this week, I learned another pair that is Listen to me carefully. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel, and loving one another. I repeat, the gospel and loving one another. And John speaks about this pair in the verse we read. He says, because this is the instruction you understood the first time you heard the gospel, that you should love one another. John is saying that the first time I preached the gospel, when I told you about Jesus, that he died for your sins, that he saved you, I also said, love one another. Some Bible versions, like the New King James Version, we say, this is the message we heard at the beginning. Love one uh, another. I repeat again uh, for John, uh, the, the gospel and loving uh, one another uh, go together. One Bible scholar helps us to understand what I'm trying to say. Get me, brothers and sisters, please hear this now. When the gospel comes, God tells you, yeah, wherever you were when God told you that he loved you, when he has told you his love, he expects you to love him back. But with loving other people. If you understood that, say amen. And so John says, because this is the instruction you understood. Like I said, some versions use the word heard. But in the Bible, when you hear something, you understand it. If you understood that, say amen. When you hear something, you understand. That's what it means. And to understand in the Bible is to do what you have been taught. In the Bible, you just don't understand something. Hear a good message and say, wow, that's a nice message. No, it doesn't work like that. In the Bible, when you hear the word of God, you are supposed to follow the word of God. Amen. Amen. When God says, do not steal, that's what it means. Do not steal. 
And so John is saying that when I preached the gospel to you, I told you about loving one another. Matter of fact, I want you to see what John is trying to say. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have touched concerning the word of life. He doesn't end there. He says in, in, in the same verse that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ. What is John trying to say? He is saying uh, like this. I did not preach the gospel to you according to the testimony of Paul. Oh, Peter, oh, Andrew, I preached the gospel to you according to my own personal experience. I saw Jesus. I looked at Jesus. I touched Jesus. Therefore, when I told you the gospel and I told you love one another, it's not something that I did not practice. Uh, but I did it. And so John is trying to help us to understand when we share the gospel of salvation, when we tell others about Jesus, we needed to demonstrate to them love. When people hear about the salvation that Jesus offers, when you explain the word of God, the truth of the Bible, it needs to be matched with love. And so I am confounded by the words of this scholar. He, he says, maybe you have propositional truth. You know about the Sabbath. You know about the second coming. You know about the judgment. You know about uh, that you need to do this. You know that maybe you have the theory that's good. But how much love and concern for others come with your expression of that truth? Somebody should have said amen. That's powerful. How much does knowing the truth impact the love you share to other people? Uh, for John, uh, preaching uh, the gospel and showing love are one in the same thing. Brothers and sisters, uh, this man uh, died uh, this week. His name, Billy Graham. He was a preacher of the gospel, a powerful preacher. But even all his preaching is meaningless if he doesn't have love. Are you with me? If there is no love, his preaching is meaningless. Hear me, brothers and sisters. I'm being deliberate and slow this morning so that you really understand what I'm saying. When you go to school, what do you expect from a teacher? An assignment, right? Am I right? Going to the classroom forms the basis of getting an assignment. When you get a job, it forms the basis of getting paid. Are you with me? When you get in the shower, it forms the basis of you getting wet. Are you understand what I'm saying? There is an out, there is a basis outflow relationship. And so John is saying, the gospel forms the foundation, the basis which is outflowed in love that you demonstrate to other people. Amen? And so John is saying, brothers and sisters, you heard this message. 
You know this message at the very beginning. John is telling the people, his audience, what they already know. Sometimes it is good to be told what we already know. Amen? Mm -hmm. I'm reminded oftentimes by my mom, even until now, Henry, I know you're in Indonesia, but I want you to do the right thing. I talked to her this week, actually. She called me up. I was, in the, I was busy preparing my sermon, and I looked at my phone. And I said, mm, do I really have time to talk to mom? The Spirit of the Lord told me, Henry, talk to your mother now. I picked up the phone. I said, Mama, how are you doing? I have missed you. I, I really did. <laughs> and then she says, how is, how is it going? I explained, I've been sick. Oh, I'm sorry, my son. But do the right thing. And so sometimes, brothers and sisters, it is good to be reminded of what we already know. And so John, after reminding the people of what they already know, uh, he now wants to make his point because uh, sometimes you need to uh, repeat and enlarge. You need to say it and say it over again, but in a new way, giving a new twist. And he says, uh, love one another, not like Cain, who belonged to the wicked one, but he uh, butchered uh, his brother. And why did he butcher him? Uh, because his actions were evil, but he, the actions of his brother were uh, righteous. He says... Do not love others like Cain. Why, uh, why does he say, do not love others like Cain? I mean, let's look at Cain for a moment. Matter of fact, this is the only time that, that John mentions uh, the Old Testament in the whole writing. And he picks this example. Uh, Cain was a son of Adam and Eve. Uh, Cain was taught that you are to sacrifice uh, to the Lord as an act of faith. Uh, but somehow Cain did not follow the will of the Lord. He chose to do his own thing and he followed, the Bible says, uh, the wicked one. The Bible is trying to help us to understand uh, Cain was a child of the devil. You remember what Jesus said in John 8, 44, that you are of your father the devil and his works you do. He was a murderer from the beginning. So the motive behind Cain's act to kill his brother was because he was motivated by the devil. He was moved by the devil. He was of the wicked one. This is just another title for the devil. Now here, what Paul, uh, John is trying to say, he picks a very strong word. He uses, the, uh, and you can see it in my translation, he uses the word butchered. Yeah, your versions will say he murdered him. But what John is trying to help us to understand is that it was a, 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 a terrible, a horrific crime. The, the, the man uh, slaughtered his, his brother like an animal. Can you imagine that? And he was not killing an enemy. He was killing his blood brother. Why did he do this? Because his actions were evil and his brothers righteous. When he saw that God accepted the, the sacrifice of his brother, he was upset. And therefore, because he was upset, he killed his brother. And I want you to see something very phenomenal right here. This is important. Uh, you see, when uh, Abel sacrificed an animal, he was showing faith. In the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come again. And so uh, Cain says, I will not do what God says. I'm going to offer my own sacrifice. God comes to Cain. He says, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Sin is right there at the door. You are about to commit a crime. Cain, don't do this. Uh, follow me. But Cain made his decision and he killed his own brother, but this was really an act 
of a lack of faith. Cain was saying like this, I can save myself. I really don't need to do what God is asking me uh, to do. And this is why the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, a Cain offered a more excellent a sacrifice. And so having made this point, and now uh, 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 John comes to the idea that he's saying, brothers and sisters, do not be surprised if you are hated. By choosing to do what is right, brothers and sisters, we are going to be hated. The Bible says, they that desire to live righteously will suffer persecution. Have you ever noticed in your life that when you're trying to do the right thing, somebody will come and say something like this, you know, you're not really changed, you're really the same. Actually, uh, last year, remember, you didn't even want to go to church. You, you actually uh, uh, used to curse. Remember you used to be a thief? And, and brothers and sisters, get this. John is, to, is not talking about an unbeliever. He's talking about Cain, who was a believer, who believed in God, but he killed his brother. And brothers and sisters, uh, sometimes the people who hate us most, the people who are most difficult, are not the non-Christians. It is the Christians. And sometimes uh, we come to church, we want to worship uh, the Lord. Somebody just says something that throws us off. And in yourself you wonder, is this a believer? Is this a child of God? Don't be surprised. If the world hates you. The world, according to John, is anybody who has values, beliefs, that are different from God's values and what he desires. And so these are the people that oftentimes will hate us because they share a different belief. They look at things differently even though they're in the church. And so having come to that point, John now comes to the major point that he's tried to drive at. And this is where I'm trying to go. We know that we have changed from condemnation to eternal life because we love fellow believers of Christ. Whoever does not love lives in uh, condemnation you see this verse it breathes uh, confidence uh, he says uh, we know and brothers and sisters it is it is one of those situations somebody comes to you and they say brother do you know they were talking about you and in your mind you're like yeah yeah i know i heard that story already uh, brother, don't you know so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that. Uh, brother, I know that's right. And sometimes we, we have to tell that person telling us, yeah, I know. Uh, John uh, is saying, uh, we know that we have uh, changed, we have uh, transformed uh, from uh, death uh, to life because we love the brothers. Get what I'm trying to tell you here, brothers and sisters. It's like you are northbound going to Sokano Hata International Airport. And there you are going to, uh, to the airport, maybe to drop somebody. I don't know. But there you are driving a car and you see that people on the road are not driving as you think they should be. And you get angry and you say, no, how can they be driving like this? You are yelling you are cursing things are not right but when you are southbound coming into jakarta you are smiling you you you, you are telling a song you're singing songs about jesus you wave at the other drivers what has happened there's a change and somehow in your going uh, to Sokano Hada and, and, and coming back, there has been a, a change. And so brothers and sisters, get what John is trying to say. We have changed. We were going north, angry, 
and upset. We once were under condemnation. We once were supposed to be killed. But guess what? God has transformed us and now we are going in a different direction. When Jesus Christ has come into your heart, brothers and sisters, you change. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. A liar becomes truthful. A drunkard becomes sober. Amen? A person who is not committed becomes uh, committed. That is what happens. And so he's saying, uh, definitely get this point, brothers and sisters. Uh, because we love our fellow brothers and sisters at the time. It shows that we are saved. It is a demonstration. It is our signature of uh, salvation. And he, he, he now uh, comes to this point. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. You know that any no murderer does not have eternal life remaining in him. John comes back to what he said already. And he's pointing to Cain. And what he is saying is that Cain was really lost. Though raised from the same family. Adam and Eve knew things about God, but he was truly lost, and that is why he committed murder. And so John is trying to tell his people, you know that the gospel and loving one another go hand in hand. You know that. It's clear. But I want you to remember that you are to love others not like Cain who murdered his brother. And you are not to hate other fellow believers. This is what John is trying to tell his audience in these verses. So I want to make it plain for you. Loving other Christians shows your salvation. Amen? Let us say that together. One, two, three, go. Man, if I was God, I would be sad <laughs> by how you said that. Let us say it one more time. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Pastor Sam, can you say it for us in the back there? Amen. Amen. Loving other Christians shows your uh, salvation. And two stories uh, come uh, to mind. You have heard the song, Amazing Grace. Oh, I love that song. Amazing. Come on now. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh man, I love that song. You see, this song was written by a slave trader and a captain of a slave ship. John Newton wrote this song. John Newton, one day, while he was captaining the, 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 the Greyhound, that's the name of the ship, in the North Atlantic, he was caught in a storm. And this storm battered him for 10 days. The sails were broken. The men were having to physically maneuver this behemoth of a ship. Of a ship. And there the men and the captain, John Newton, realized that today or this time it is over. On the 11th day, uh, this, the story goes, and in the testimony of John Newton, uh, he, he previously... He didn't like the things about the Bible. His mother had tried to teach him the stories of the Bible. But on this day, this day that he believed was his last day. He said, hey man, what do I have to lose? And there he started to remember the things that his mother had taught him. And he says, it's as if heaven descended on him and lifted him up. Brothers and sisters, 
when God wants to save us, he sends all of his resources on us. The whole of heaven is invested. That's why the Bible says there is joy in heaven for a single soul. The whole of heaven is invested in this one person who is desirous to be saved and pulls him up. And that was the experience of John Newton. And, and John Newton was converted to be a Christian. But John Newton still was a slave shipmaster. At least three times he sold slaves. Three times he went back on uh, the ship. 34 years later, John Newton shuddering to write. John Newton with tears in his eyes couldn't really see. He wrote a tract talking about the heinous things he did in trading black African slaves. He wrote this track, and his friend, William Wilberforce, read this track, gave it to the members of the British Parliament. They read this track, and they abolished slavery. Somebody say amen. amen. Yes, it took long, 34 years to be exact, but John Newton's story demonstrates that when a heart has been transformed, it will demonstrate love. Amen? Amen. John Newton changed the course of history, even though it was late. And the second story I want to tell you about is about this man. He's called John, the son of thunder. Oh, this brother, you did not want to be near him because if you made him mad, he would get at you and he would want to kill you and he would tell you a piece of his mind. Son of thunder. But this man it says, that which we have heard, that which we have seen, we have touched it, we have looked upon it. I am declaring to you, I am in fellowship of Jesus Christ. John, the beloved, the writer of this epistle, was transformed by Jesus. Oh, I love John. When he is writing his pen, the ink of his pen oozes love. Matter of fact, I will call John the doctor of love. He had a PhD in love, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen, my brother. He had a PhD in love. There is no other writer we have in the Bible that writes more about love than John the beloved. How does a son of thunder become a doctor of love? I don't know, but what I do know is that Jesus touched his life. Somebody say amen. And so when Jesus has come into your life, and when you demonstrate love, it shows that you have been demonstrated. And somebody might be saying, Pastor, you cannot be correct. Are you saying that when I love somebody that saves me? No, no, no. Don't misunderstand me. This is what I'm saying. Faith in God's promises must be so real that the love it produces proves the reality of that faith. Somebody say amen. <clears throat> Let me just go back because I think I stole an amen from myself and from you. Faith in God's promises must be so real, brothers and sisters, that the love it produces proves the reality <clears throat> of faith. Mm, 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 mm. Man, we're going to get this right one day. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. God bless you, Brother Evil, because you're blessing my heart. See, loving others is like a signature. A signature shows approval. It shows acceptance. And we run after celebrities. We run after people to sign for us. Am I right? Please sign here. Please sign here. And if I tell you I have the signature of the president of Jakarta, I think several of you want to eat lunch with me today in the fellowship lunch. And you want to know, Pastor, I am an Indonesian, but I've never gotten the signature of the president of Indonesia. How do you do it? Amen? 
But a signature shows acceptance. It shows approval. And so love works in the same way. When we love others, it simply shows that we have been accepted by God. It shows a sign that I am a child of God. And, and, and you know, people can doubt many things about you. They can doubt whether you know the gospel. They can doubt whether you can preach well. Uh, some of you are even sleeping because maybe I'm boring you. I don't care. But what is important is for me to demonstrate love. Amen. And when I do that, it shows that I am accepted and approved of God. Look at this, brothers and sisters. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Look at the logic. You are saying you love God. You have never seen him. But your brother who doesn't have money, your brother who doesn't have transportation to come to church, uh, your brother who has never heard the gospel, you have no time for him. How can you say you love somebody? Brothers and sisters, uh, the love of God uh, put in us is so practical, right? It should be tasted. It should be seen. We should be able to touch it. That's what the, the, the word of God is trying to tell us. Oh, I love the words of this songwriter. This songwriter, his name Paul uh, Chapuka. He's from my uh, home country. He sings a song, and the song goes something like this. The Lord does not have hands. The Lord has no ears. The Lord has no eyes. The Lord has no feet. The Lord has no hug. The Lord has no kiss. The Lord has no word of encouragement. But he uses us to touch others. He uses us to look at others. He uses our mouths to encourage somebody else. He uses us. We are his media. We are his uh, emissaries. We are his representatives. We are the go-between brothers and sisters. When somebody comes to you, brother, I don't have money. Brother, how can you help me? It is not helpful to tell him, I will pray for you. That's not what God is asking. God is asking, pull out your wallet, give that 20,000 rupiah. Amen, Lord. God does not have hands. God does not have feet. God does not have hands. But he uses us. I have been 35 minutes preaching now. I'm keeping time, don't worry. So I'm getting to the end. Pastor, it makes sense that when I love others, it shows that I'm saved. It, it, it shows, it makes sense, and I, I believe that. But how can I love others? How, how can it be possible for me? Very simple. You must be born again. And that's what Paul, John is trying to say. Is that we know that we, we have changed from death or we have passed from condemnation uh, to eternal life because we love others and what he was trying to help us to understand that change like you're going northbound to Sokano Hata and coming uh, southbound it happens when Jesus comes into your life and so brothers and sisters the new birth happens when Jesus Christ comes into your life you accept him and say Lord I accept what you have done on the cross for me the Holy Spirit makes it so clear and then you say and then you say, I want to be baptized. Amen? And you are willing to publicly display your new birth going through the waters of baptism. Brother and sister, if this is your desire, it can happen right here, right now. And if you desire to be baptized, brothers and sisters, we do not hold you. We are saying, come. And I'm sure if Pastor Samson hears such news, he's going to be so excited. 
You see, brothers and sisters, I preach to see people give their life to Jesus. There is no greater joy than seeing you give your life to Jesus Christ or giving a, seeing a sinner giving his life uh, to Jesus uh, Christ. Pastor, I am born again. I have been baptized. So what do you have to say to me? I say what Paul says. I die daily. What Paul says in these words is that I experience the new birth every day. Let me just ask you a very practical question. How many times in a week do you need to eat? How many times? At least, <laughs> at least three times. Some of us, we eat ten times a day. Have mercy. And then we say, I want to go to the gym. I want to be fit. You see, brothers and sisters, let me give you a, a spiritual secret. As it is in the physical world, it is also in the spiritual world. The prayer you prayed yesterday is not sufficient for today. The words of the Bible that you read yesterday are not sufficient for today. Today is a new day. It has its new challenges. You need to pray afresh today. And that's why Paul says, I need to be born again every day. Brothers and sisters, if you are saying, I am already born again, what are you saying to me, pastor? I tell you, be born again. Experience the love of Jesus afresh and uh, anew. I like what this president or the former president of the United States used to do, the 34th president of the United States, Harry Truman. Whenever he was away from his wife, whenever he was away from his wife, he would write letters to her. And he wrote 1,300 letters. And people were trying to study, why did he write letters to his wife? Can we learn something else about him? And you know what they discovered? The man simply loved his wife. <laughs> That's why he did it. He simply wanted to tell her every day uh, or whenever he was away from her, honey, I am thinking about you. Yes, I am the most powerful man in the world, but you go with me in my heart every day. I mean, everywhere. And so, brothers and sisters, we can perfect love. We can be better lovers. Every day we can figure out, Lord, I loved him yesterday. How do I do today? I loved her yesterday. How do I do today? Give me creativity and skill how I can love my wife. Give me creativity and skill how I can love my brother and my sister. Maybe I need to pray for them. Maybe I need to send a text message about uh, something inspirational. I don't know, but Lord, please help me today to show love. Pastor, I'm struggling with anger and hate. Actually, I didn't talk to my wife this morning. She's sitting in the back, I'm sitting in the front. We're actually sitting together, but we haven't, we are actually not talking. My brother, mm -mm -mm, that brother, he's so mean, he gets all the privileges and advantages of our parents. Pastor, I don't like him. I'm angry with him. Pastor, I'm angry. I hate somebody. I'm angry. One day, I'm getting to the end, brothers and sisters. It's exactly 41 minutes. So, this person visits the zoo. And after visiting the zoo, she was looking at a lion and she says wow that lion he's so cute like my cat at home he's not so bad this cage is a restriction to him the zookeeper says that lion if given the chance is going to kill you it looks so peaceful, yes, but if given the chance, it is going to kill you. Brothers and sisters, some of us are murder waiting to happen. And the only reason why maybe some of us haven't killed somebody 
is because the cages of embarrassment, the cages of going to prison, and what people are going to think of us is what is keeping us back. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, hating somebody, not liking somebody, for whatever reason, is embryonic murder. It is murder waiting to happen. If given a chance, brothers and sisters, like Cain, you will kill your brother. And so, brothers and sisters, let me make it clear to you, uh, anger and hate is the basis of why people murder other people. Oh, pastor, I'm scared because this morning I was hateful to my loved one. So does that mean that I am murder waiting to happen? No, no, no. There is good news, brothers and sisters. Let me not scare you. Here is the good news. It is not the occasional good deed or the occasional misdeed that determines your destiny. So let me put it in another way. It's not the fact that today you became angry that it shows you are lost. What the Bible teaches is that even Christians, those who have been born again, may commit sin and they do commit sin. Isn't that your experience? At least that's, that's mine. I'm, 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 I'm bold enough and courageous enough to admit that even though I'm a pastor, I do uh, commit sin sometimes. I have to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I am sorry. But it doesn't mean that I am lost. If you have been loving for five years and today you are hateful, it doesn't mean that you are lost. What the Bible is teaching us, get up, dust yourself off, tell God you're sorry, repent of it. And move on. The Bible says, let not your son, the son, go down on your anger. And so, brothers and sisters, it is not the occasional good deed or the occasional misdeed that determines the life. It is the habit. If you are doing the same thing 10 years, 15 years, 16 years, that is what determines your destiny. So just because you became angry this morning, no, nah, it doesn't mean you're lost. You can repent, tell God you're sorry, move on. Dust yourself off. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Don't feel sad. Don't beat yourself up. Oh, man, what? No, no, don't beat yourself up. Go to the Lord. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Lord, you know I did it. I'm sorry. The Lord will say, I know, my son. It's okay. Let's move on. The blood of Jesus still covers you. So here's it, folks. Here is it, folks. What's love got to do with it? Well, love's got to do with our salvation. It's not that love saves us, but love simply indicates we are saved. Amen? Loving other Christians shows your Salvation. Every eye is closed. Every head is bowed as we pray to the Lord right now. Perhaps you are saying you need to be born again. You have never been baptized. You may simply raise your hand. Nobody's looking. Every eye is closed. Every head is bowed. You can simply raise your hand. God is going to see you. And then you can talk to me or Pastor Samson about it. Perhaps you are saying, Pastor, I need to die daily. I need to be born every day. I need to, to show love every day. Today I want to do that. You may also raise your hand. Nobody's looking. Only God is going to see you. Perhaps you're saying, Pastor, I have had hate in my heart. And I realize that, hey, if given an opportunity, I can commit and do something that I'll regret for the rest of my life. But I want to be transformed. I want to change. If that is you, you may also raise your hand. Nobody's looking, only God. Father, 
raised hands have gone up. I didn't even see them, <laughs> to be honest. But they have gone up. Please, Lord, do for your sons and daughters what they cannot do for themselves. In the name of Jesus, I have prayed. Amen. Now it is time to give to the Lord what belongs to him. I like to call the deacons and I'd just like to offer to offer prayer uh, for offerings. Let us pray. Father, the little we have, we want to give back to you. Please bless us. Give it to us. I mean, please bless us as we give to you. Please accept this humble offering. In the name of Jesus, I have prayed. Amen. <laughs>